this book, Moments That Made the Movies, it is such a gorgeous volume. It really is. Very beautifully Good. put together. Good. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. Tell, tell, me, first, tell me first of all the, the, the criteria in, in choosing these moments. Well, it was very open. Um, the publisher and I both had the idea that there were moments in movies that worked better than, say, much of the rest of the movie. Plus, there were moments that people treasured and remembered. Um, And started to put together a list of them. And I was very reluctant to do the best moments, because I think that's as foolish as any kind of... um, Academy Awards thing. Um, mm-hmm. So it was a very personal choice. I wanted to cover fairly broad historical range. I wanted to have some foreign films in there. I wanted some obvious things, things that everybody would anticipate would be in there. But also I wanted a number of things that were um, unexpected, surprises. But above all, I just held to this idea that there are these certain moments that work in a magical way that tells us something about the movies. And, you know, it was agreed that that we would illustrate them as richly and as well as we could so that although it it looks like and it is a coffee table book, it is an illustrated book, still I would say that the, the relationship between the pictures and the text is really quite lively and quite important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is an interesting thing about moments, too, because, I mean, you hear actors talk about moments, creating moments. Uh, you, yes. And when we remember films, the films that mean the most to us, we that's how we remember them. We remember those moments that grabbed us most, most of all. Absolutely. And, of course, you know, something has happened in the last, well, 20 years, I suppose, that really underlines this. Once upon a time, we went to see movies. We saw whole movies. And it may be that we we always felt, oh, there's a certain scene that I love above all. Uh, But it wasn't really until video came along that we had the chance to isolate Mm -hmm. certain moments And just look at those. Uh, So that, I mean, for instance, if you were to take the the library of Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers films, there's a whole lot of plot material, which, Mm -hmm. quite honestly, uh, doesn't stand the test of time too well. But there are numbers, moments, that are just superb. And people have learned to use their DVD or whatever, uh, to isolate those moments and play them over and over again, so that the the moment has become much more than just an extract or a quote. It has often become nearly the thing itself. Mhm, mhm. I agree with you. And, and uh, out of curiosity, what is the moment that made you fall in love with movies? Well, I guess that would be something very, very early, and I think it's like that for most of us. And uh, I can tell you a moment that I completely misunderstood at the time, but it it meant a lot to me. There is a... I was taken when I was very, very young to see Olivier's Henry V. I I probably was only five. And I remembered and was certain I had seen a moment in the film where the English page boys are burning, where they're on fire in the camp because the French have set fire to them. And I cried so much I had to be taken out of the movie. Years later, I realized that what I had seen was a dissolve of two images of fire and the boys' faces. And I had I had interpreted that as an act of burning and slaughter. Um, I made a mistake, but, you know, that's one of the things about the movies. The emotion tells us what we've seen. 
rather more forcefully than our reason sometimes. And it is always fascinating to me, and I guess this is the basis of all critical thinking on the arts, um, how how we interpret moments through the, the prism of our own life experience. So the, the, these yeah. moments yeah, can mean something very different from from creator intent uh, and something different from the whole, as you, as you said earlier. Yeah, I think you're so right. Uh, um, you know, movies seem to be very big public events, or certainly once upon a time, when everyone went to to a theater, they seem to be very big public events. But you're so right; they they reach us in private places, and and um, the better the movie is, I think, the more cunning and accurate it is in digging into our souls, so that. Uh, sometimes someone can be unbearably moved by something and the person sitting next to them thinks it's a sort of ordinary casual moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me about, I wanted to ask you about film culture um, because your your work, your investment in in keeping film history alive is so admirable. Um, And there, there was a time when many of the movies profiled in this book where you felt, these films existed in the middle of a very active, vital film culture that you you sat around and you talked about it and you examined the movies after you saw them and there was an excitement there. Uh, Where is film culture today? Well, I think there's a good side and there's a bad side to it. Um, The bad side is, I would say, that relatively speaking, we have a young audience now that does not know its film history nearly as well as the young audience of, say, the late 60s and the 70s. There was a Mm -hmm. huge, huge wave of film education, and that has passed. And a lot of people nowadays think that the movies began with Star Wars, or even much more recently than that, and they are uninterested in a great deal of earlier material. So that it's very hard to get young people, your own children, to watch black and white films very much harder to get them to watch silent films. Yeah. It doesn't mean that sometimes if you trick them into it, they aren't deeply impressed by it, but it's hard to get them to do it. On the other hand, we live in a time when it is possible to see nearly every film that ever was made. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember a time where you sometimes had to wait years to see a film you really wanted to see. Um, Nowadays, the resources on video, in private collections, so on and so forth, it's so great, complete access to it. That's an extraordinary thing. Um, But as you say, the culture is changing. Movies Movies were something that people venerated, nearly worshipped. Now, they have passed into the much larger world of visual information they compete with things on youtube uh youtube is a collection of movie moments if you know what i mean it's Mm -hmm. full of these wonderful sometimes sometimes very silly sometimes horrible moments that people watch amazing number of times and i think there's a lot to be said for the case that movies in the sense of like two hour story films they're fading away, and it would not yeah. surprise me if in the next few years, young people particularly started making really different form movies where they were they were much more open-ended, they were much more open to viewer participation. So it's a very exciting time like that. But if you are if you are devoted to say Casablanca and the films of that era playing in a certain kind of theater, then it's upsetting because that world is on its way out. Turner Classic Movies does a great job in preserving it, mm-hmm. but I get the feeling that the audience for Turner Classic Movies is getting older and older and not really being replaced adequately by younger people. And I guess, too, speaking about the new generation and all the great technologies that we're ha- we have now, I mean, a discussion about moments is is apropos because uh, a lot of people they they only respond to to to, to moments. I mean, and it speaks to the yes. shorter attention span and the kind of 
and, and they're very sophisticated Absolutely. with the visuals now. And and already, you know, on YouTube and for some years now, there have been things that cater to that shorter attention span, which I think are very good. I think they're very interesting. And, and we always, in the great old days, we always underestimated and overlooked the value of short films. Well, short mm-hmm. films, or shorter than old-fashioned films, are coming back with a vengeance. And, and uh, they do, as you say, they underline the momentary quality of it all. Yeah. You know, it's unfair of me to ask this because, I mean, your your book is filled with, with all of these moments and they all have their their various qualities that that make them memorable. But how, how do you f- define a memorable moment in a film? What does it have to contain? Well, I would say the most important thing is as the moment begins and as it develops, and it can be very short, you have that feeling as you watch it, ah, this is it. This is the moment the film is really about. This is the this is the turning point. This is where this is where the meaning is provided. This is the crucial thing. It it's it's as if it's rather as if you were watching a sporting event, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. you have inning after inning of mundane play. And it's 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 okay and it's watchable and it's fun. But then all of a sudden you come up the bottom of the eighth, bases loaded, and a big hitter comes up, and you know this is it. That you know the game is going to be decided in the next two or three minutes. It's something like that. It's a sense of extra significance at occasion, I think. Mm. And a lot of these great moments, um, I mean, particularly in the 70s films that I'm thinking of, a lot yeah. of them are powerful and memorable because of the moment in which they were made, because they were so much oh, of yeah. their time. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah. So is there, an, is there an element of that in a lot of these moments, or, or are they generally oh, more yeah. timeless? I think, I think there is. I mean, I think there are moments uh, in films that when they were made were great moments, but have dated terribly, because the, the whole attitude to storytelling and what you can do in a movie has changed completely. So uh, it would be easy, I think, to find moments in, say, silent cinema that were staggering in their time, but but Mm -hmm. kind of tame now. So yes, the period. Films are always of their period. And, um, you know, you take the scene, for instance, which is in the book where Michael Corleone becomes Michael, really, where he, he kills the two men in the restaurant. Mm. Well, that came at a time when we had terribly fearful feelings about murder and assassination. Uh, and it was in the air. You know, this was it, it was famously the age in which people were being knocked up in front of our eyes. And here was a character we had learned to like and admire in certain ways. And he took the decision to kill two people, which was against his prior nature. But I think part of the great impact that moment had was not just the framework of The Godfather, but it was, oh my God, our sense of murder Mm. is enlarging. It's it's altering. So it was very much... um, to do with the time and and you don't always know what's going to last best but i do think it's a very important aspect of film yeah yeah who do you think is the best uh filmmaker at uh creating those moments because i mean reading your book first of all um i I notice a, a name that pops up very often in your book in a certain period of time is jack nicholson and yeah i mean and i I mean, who who has a more staggering career than Nicholson? I mean, he he was so smart with working with the very best, most interesting directors, yeah, and he yeah. really defined that period of filmmaking. He for did. A lot of he did. Yeah. People have said this to me, and they've said, "Did you realize how many Nicholson moments there are?" And I, <laughs> I, I have to say, as I was doing the book, no, I didn't quite. But afterwards, I looked back and I said, "Oh my God, yes." And the defense, I would say, is that 
not only is he a great actor, not only is he very much an actor of that 60s, 70s period, but he had a kind of appetite for moments. Mm. Give him give him a scene which was of the kind I'm talking about, a decisive moment. And he was great. In other words, if you had a key moment in the baseball game, he was the guy you wanted to come up to the plate because mm-hmm. you know that he feasts upon the big time, the moment. The pressure brings out the the best in him. And obviously, lots of other actors have been like that, and, and, and lots of filmmakers have. I think you could argue that all all great filmmakers have this instinct for the moment. Mm-hmm. I think Polanski has it. I think Chinatown is a film full of moments like that, unexpected moments. They fit within the genre, but they take you by surprise, too. Yeah. And um, I think the whole feeling... Oh, I'm going to tell you a story in this movie. You, you kind of know the story because you've seen stories like it before. But wait a minute. 30 minutes in or whatever, just like in the Psycho say, I'm going to do something that blows your mind. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I'm going to do something that suddenly says, it's not the kind of story you thought it was going to be. It's something quite different. And, and I think that's, a, you know, that jumping off the cliff feeling uh, it's a very exciting part of movie going. Still is, I think, and has always been very important. And and uh, it, it's that feeling of certain directors tell you, um, Hitchcock always did, which was watch very closely because I'm going to surprise you in a moment. Yeah. And and a lot of these moments, too, the, the ones that you're talking about, uh, whether it be Nicholson or Hitchcock, uh, a lot of these moments are defined by this element of 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 risk. Uh, we're going to yes. we're going to take this chance. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Reminds, it, it reminds mm-hmm. me of the, that the the Fincher film Seven and the, the that ending that yes. everyone remembers. They they knew, you know, even if this movie tanks, if it's a late show movie years from now, people yeah. remember all oh, the the head in the box movie. So I mean, the, yeah. and that was a moment that made them want to make that movie. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and you know, you as that scene comes up, you, you're filled with dread because you sort of know what it is, and you sort of say to yourself, "How much is he going to make me see? How much is he going to insist that I I see as a thing?" Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of content, um, mm-hmm. a lot of these great films in the past they were actually about something. Like we said before, they had an investment in the time in which they were made. They had something to say about that. Uh, yeah. What about the the, the content of, of films today? Are, are films really investing in the world in which we live today? Well, I think that um, I think we're at a time where films find it very difficult to be commercial and to address the kind of experience that we're going through. You know, I mean, you take a film like the uh, French-Austrian film Amour of a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. I think it was a great film. I think he's a wonderful filmmaker, Michael Haneke. Um, but it clearly was the case that even people who had read reviews of the film, which urged them to go see it, they were just a little afraid because they said, do I really want to see a couple who are so in love and have been together so long that they go to the point of death, murder? Uh, It frightened people away. And of course, if you frighten people away, then you're not doing the box office function that most films are supposed to do. We live in very, very frightening times. We make a lot of totally concocted, artificial, frightening films. Uh, But the real things that frighten us, uh, our own death, what's going to happen to our children after we've gone, uh, the way the weather may take over the world, things like that, the collapse of the economy, um, those things are very tricky for film because... Filmmakers and the industry, and it's an expensive industry, you can't make those films that cheaply. They still rest upon the principle, I've got to entertain people. I ought to offer them something that will 
help them get through life, you know, that will give them some pleasure, some ease. That's a tough, tough situation. And the movies have always been torn between being an art form and a public show. And I think it's remarkable in a hundred years how many films have managed to be both great entertainments and really artistic achievements. The Godfather say, you know. Uh but you can't do it every time. It's it's tough and these days I would say without a doubt, Hollywood the filmmaking capital has really conceded that the most interesting material by far is on television, in long form television. And, you know, life is being dealt with there with a candor and a harshness that movies would have a very tough time competing with. Well, yes, and these these anti heroes that uh that that Nicholson made his name on during this period of time. He really We're invented seeing... them as a modern yeah. form, yeah. Yeah. They're on yeah. T- they're on T V now. That's that's where we find All the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you think that this is a the, the golden age has kind of moved over into the medium of television? <laughs> I think gold keeps shifting. You know, as soon as you think you found gold, you find it slippery enough and it moves away. Uh, yeah. I do think at the moment, television for the last I don't know seven or eight years, television has been the place to get really grown up entertainment, and and I think for me most of the American films that have really stirred me, have been on television. But I don't count on it staying that way. I I think that... I think there's going to be an amazing explosion of very short films that kids make that you're going to see on YouTube or places like that that I think will be outrageous, comic. Uh, they will be like Marx Brothers films in a minute, if you know what I mean. Uh, I, oh. think, uh, I, I think that's going to come along... And that may be the next gold rush. Um, And television may go back to being a very dull form, which it's always been capable of being. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's certainly imaginable that it could return back to that state very soon. I'm afraid so, yes. It's also very encouraging, uh, the the, the shift that's gone on in television now and and how people are reacting to it. Because, I mean, this is obviously long-form storytelling, so it takes patience. Uh, uh, and, well, and I, I think that's I encouraging. Agree. Yeah. Very encouraging because you know that there, there are so many ways in which we're told, "Oh, our kids can't concentrate." But you know, you can't watch Breaking Bad over the years uh, without really remembering and following it. And and it's like reading classic novels in a way, and and they're mm-hmm. serialized just like Dickens was, if you know what I mean. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, th- thank you again for talking to me, and thank you for the gorgeous. Oh, it's podcast. my pleasure. All the okay. work you do is Good. so so appreciated. It, it, thank you. Well, you're very kind. I'm I'm so pleased to have talked to you.